Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the talk on liberating effect of don't know. Uh, in Zen, when we talk about don't know, we are already making a mistake. But if you don't talk about it, how could you make your way to it? How could you bridge your current mental position and situation with what I'm supposed to talk about? So we are building a burning bridge. This bridge serves you as you walk from what you know to what you don't know. But it's already burning because we are not making it permanent. We are making it as an expedient means for your understanding and that understanding develops step by step as we are here today and hopefully as you ponder on the meaning of the speech tomorrow. When we talk about the lack of information, everybody gets upset. I'm supposed to know how I get to uh, St. Paul on line number one or uh, Port d'Orléans on another line. And when you go, then this uh, driver or this recording lets you know where you are. If you understand intonation, um, then you understand why and how they say that. I was amazed how subtle these announcements are to let you know what you're supposed to know. Uh, you get in, the doors close, the train starts, and uh, they say, uh, Montparnasse bienvenue. Then you're at the station, and they say, Montparnasse bienvenue. And I imagined how I would react if I was my own dog and I followed my owner and my owner understood everything, but I didn't because I don't understand human speech cognitively, but I understand my owner's mind. I would understand the intonation makes him first prepare because the rising tone is actually asking you, do you know this? Are you aware that we are approaching Châtelet, and then when you're at the station, it's imperative. Make a decision. If you want to get off, Châtelet. Make a decision. Stay or go. I wouldn't understand the intonation because as a dog, I wouldn't know linguistics. But my owner, my master, would get ready the first time and then make a decision the second time. And I would notice, I would be trained to observe my surroundings, to observe my master. So to act without knowledge, because I cannot know, but I can feel. When I got to Korea, I didn't understand a word of Korean. So in a way, I was in between this dog and the human being, but I could really sense people's eyes, their movements, their body language, the general situation and relationship we were in. And of course, we could speak English in the International Zen Center. So that was in between knowing and not knowing. And not understanding the language really enabled me to do one thing. Observe the mind of the people who are talking to you in an unintelligible tongue. This lasted two years. So then, I started to experience the value of this don't know. Because later on, when I learned Korean, I could juxtapose my nonverbal impression with the verbal meaning of what they said. Because what they meant was in the body, in the eyes, in the, in the tone of their skin, in the way they had their hair, in the way they were sitting or walking. That's what they meant. But what they said may have been different, and nearly always we say something else than what we mean. There's the discrepancy between our intention and our condition, our compromise and our message. So this don't know gives you, first, the big advantage of not being attached to thoughts. When you're attached to thinking, you lose all the meta-communication, you lose the subtle perception, you lose the emotional layer because you're attached to thoughts. 
This thinking process is neither good nor bad, but it takes most of the energy in your frontal lobe and leaves almost nothing to perceive. So how can we unite the skills of intuition and cognition? For that, we have to go back before thinking. And that's the mind that jhana, or later on in China, channa, and later on chan, in Korean, son, in Japanese, zen, in Indo-Chinese dialect, tian, was teaching. Zen doesn't mean that you lose your thinking. You only lose your attachments. Zen does not mean that you lose any of your useful cognition and valid perception. You only lose your illusions. I hasten to add all these distinctions because in the West, people either don't understand this or they're afraid of what they understand. So this don't know cannot be understood, just like you cannot see your eyes, your visual consciousness, you cannot see that. You cannot hear your ears. You cannot think your thinking mind, because that's what thinks. So likewise, you cannot understand the mind that understands. When I'm saying this, I can see that in your mind, all these definitions, they short-circuit your pre-existing concepts. And that's exactly what this is supposed to do. It goes into the void. The void of hearing something but not really understanding it. And believe me, this is just the beginning. You're not losing anything, but you're opening up something at the cost of letting go of your habits, perceiving your karma, and entering the state which is not the lack of information, but it is the freedom from being attached to thinking. It's very different. So getting rid of false views, getting rid of half-baked truths, getting rid of absolute cognition as we see it sometimes, that our thinking is the highest, the ultimate, is worth it because it opens up a gate. First of all, it opens up your emotional intelligence, which we lack so much in the West. In Korea, we had this distinct perception that even the most beginner Buddhist knows more about what we are supposed to do as monks than we do, because they've been doing it for decades. The whole society is saturated with Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. So if you're conditioned to take your thinking as relative, something small but important in your consciousness, and you develop your emotions, likewise, or even more, you develop your intuition, just like that, then you have multiple mental skills and a lot bigger bandwidth to perceive this world. If anyone comes tomorrow, which I hope most of you do, we'll do an exercise. We will perceive the sounds, and you try to keep this perception as steady and stable as possible. If you don't, then something else takes over. That's your internal noise. So when you can perceive the sounds uninterrupted, that means you are not attached to thinking. If your thinking takes over, you lose the sounds. It has an intimate connection with this moment. That's why in Zen we say, here and now you can wake up. But very few people actually know the background why. If your mind is cluttered up to thinking and thinking and thinking, then you lose this clear mirror consciousness which perceives everything and everyone as we are. This world as it is, the other human being as he or she is. Instead, our thoughts, preconceptions, Judgments, they all take over. And then we lose most of reality. So, we have many kinds of thinking. If you are attached to thinking, like I'm attached to this stick right now, I cannot take the phone into my hand. I cannot drink. I cannot, you know, hit the sound ball because I'm attached to this object. So being attached to a name or a form or a sense of identity is very limiting, but we don't notice it most of the time. 
how much our sense of I, my, me limits us. Then we attain some kind of freedom. The other extreme is being attached to freedom. As abstract as it may seem, or as desirable as it may seem, being attached to freedom is equally a problem. Now my hand is free. I'm not attached to the stick. I practice Zen, I learn to put it down. Put it all down. But if I'm attached to this empty hand, I cannot get in connection with anything. Cannot grab the phone, cannot grab the stick again, cannot grab the water pitcher again, because I'm attached to freedom. These kinds of people fall into depression very soon. They have their big individual freedom, but they don't have meaningful relationships. They don't have commitments. They don't have loyalty. They don't have anything truly valuable in their lives because they are as transitory as the world itself. If you want a cherished relationship, you have to put energy into it. And I don't mean just flowers for her birthday. Every single day, every single moment, you have to put energy into a relationship, otherwise it's gone. The world is impermanent, bound to causes and conditions, and it's far from being perfect. These three marks of existence are intricately related to your thoughts, emotions, and intuition. How you act, how you talk, how you think, and how you feel. So being free from your cognition, being free from your judgments, being free from your dualistic ideas is the gateway to expanding your consciousness. Many people, especially in the West, believe it's the other way around. I have to read another book. I have to consult another knowledgeable person. I have to gain more wisdom. But if you don't wipe the slate clean, if you don't have a basic experience of your true nature, if you don't have something which is before thinking, before emotions, then the foundation is not clear. Then you try to build this up as another layer of yourself, another extension or expansion of your personality. And if the foundation is not clear, then it can collapse. Under stress, it will not hold. When are we under the biggest stress, except our death, maybe? Well, when our sense of identity, sense of good and bad, sense of uh, mission in our world, they are challenged. So then, your mental foundations are put to test. Now, how do you respond then? Can you respond with wisdom and compassion and selfless action, or you respond with anger, greed, and ignorant views, which seem pretty bright at the moment, but the moment you've said that, they're gone. They only serve self-defense, nothing more. If you attain our true nature, which is free from any conceptual thoughts, good and bad, then this mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. And on top of that, you can think as much as you want, because you will never identify with your thoughts, never identify with your dualistic views, and never identify with your emotions either. I know this doesn't sound attractive. I'm not promising you anything here. I'm not giving you a special skill, or an expensive mantra, or a quick path to enlightenment, and a sure ticket to nirvana. Zen is not like that. Zen is the adult version of Buddhism. No toys. Sorry. If you look at your own problems, everybody in this room has lived long enough to experience some kind of crisis in your lives. How did you get through it? Especially in terms of creating your next crisis. How good was your solution? What did your solution depend on? Was it dependent on your ideas, on your emotional predispositions, or just your willpower, or your vision, or your sense of mission in life? What was the foundation of your solution? Well, you can discover that when the next critical cycle bears fruit and the next crisis is born. That's when you can see the quality of your solution. In Zen, we say, only go straight. 
Straight means do not open another cycle. If you opened another cycle, you did not go straight. You had some I, my, me, some ego in it, which bent the path. You put yourself to the center again, and then it started the critical cycle again. When it gets ugly, then you suffer, and you make others suffer. How does this connect to don't know? Well, you attain don't know, then you don't make anything. That means you don't have any projections. You don't attach to anything. I've just demonstrated that. You don't hold anything. That means your past doesn't, you know, burden you. And when you determine to do that in your mind, then something really and truly marvelous starts to happen. You feel that less becomes more. Life becomes more simple. Relationships become more meaningful. And critical situations will have a different angle, a different edge. If you start to meditate, the simple, clear perception type of meditation, then, first of all, you see your mind really as a movie. And you don't attach to the movie. You stop being just an actor in the movie. You realize you can watch this from the spectator's aisle, from a seat. Not only that, next step is you realize you actually direct that movie. You make that movie. You're not a victim of your fate or your karma. You make that. And next step is you see that there's a room where the projector is. So you go up there and you see that the film, the real, has an end. It's not infinite. Your karma has a beginning and it has an end. If you let it run out, it will be over. And then this pure and clear light, which is the substance of all these perceptions, that will hit you for the first time in your life. And then it's your job what kind of film or movie or reel of celluloid you put on again, if you do. So that's what non-attachment can do. This don't know can be compared with this clear light of the projector machine and anything that the sensory reality offers is the movie. The movie itself doesn't exist, especially not without the light that projects it onto this observable reality, as we say. When you look at your own problems, uh, the first important step is to take up a clear distance whereby you can observe it. If you have something in your face, you can't observe it. You have at least a little distance, you can observe it. This is not avoiding responsibility. I don't mean that. It's not distancing in some of therapists, you know, speech. It's establishing mind space and clarity so that your one mind could observe, could perceive what's going on. And then you see how you, how you make it. You see your own hand in it. Okay? Then you stop judging the problem. You stop judging yourself. You stop judging other people. This kind of perception stops these waves of I like, I don't like. My responsibility, others' responsibility. Love and hate, up and down. This becomes very, very clear, like the unmoving mirror of a lake. And for the first time, you see the clouds and the overhanging trees truly as they are. So that's why being non-judgmental is really important. And for that, this kind of experience of no thinking is really important, that you can actually do this. You are alive because you stopped being attached to your habits. More alive, more spontaneous. So when judgments go away, you see that you can withdraw your energy from recreating your problems. You can attain a mind which is before thinking, therefore before creation, before movement. And then your identity stops being connected to your karma. I know it sounds weird. It even may sound strange, but that's how it works. 
First of all, like I said, you stop the dualistic judgment, then you stop the identification, and the third step is withdrawing your energy from recreating your karma. If you complete these three steps, you're free. Because your karma doesn't exist by itself. Your mind makes it. If you don't have that thinking mind or willfully emotional mind, if you don't have any dualistic ideas, if you don't have identification, if you don't put energy into it, it's gone without a trace. And that's why in Zen we say, without any education, you are already complete. This doesn't mean you should give up your studies on Sorbonne. This means complete your diploma, your graduation, and go beyond it. Conceptual studies are great, but all of you know it's not the final stepping stone of your career, especially not as a human being interested in attaining clarity or transcendental experience. So when you hear this sound, did you have any thinking? So Zen is attaining big don't know. That has no name and no form, no past, no present, no future. But we always want to know something so that we could understand it. So when I say no name, no form, no life, no death, no past, no present, no future, I use a negative definition. If I used any positive definition, it would act like a magnet and your thoughts would be attracted like small pieces of metal. Then you would be more attached to it. We can always say what it is not, but we can never say in its true nature what it is. Let me give you an example. En français, c'est l'eau. It's water. In Hungarian, I say vis. In Korean, mul. In Japanese, Thank you. Vada, paruski. But if you're in the desert and somebody comes to you and says in Lithuanian, vandu, water, mul, viz, in 10 languages, you can still die. If you don't have the experience of this, you didn't drink. Now, we understand that with water, but how come we don't understand that with our own true self? If we confuse our true nature with our thoughts, feelings, perceptions, impulses, or any form of consciousness, we are dying in the desert because we didn't drink. Okay? So that's why practice is important. That's why any kind of practice which leads you beyond thinking is important. You don't have to go into complicated studies. But when you see in your, in your heart how things begin and how they end, how you attain the Alpha and the Omega, then you start to connect to these fundamental teachings of the greatest Western Bodhisattva. Then also the Oriental teachings begin to make sense, a very different sense from just reading. If you practice, you attain it. If you just read it, you will understand it. And in the desert, this understanding doesn't help you. In critical times, understanding only will not help you. When you die, you cannot think because your brain stops to function. Then your thinking cannot help you because it's not there. This is not to make you scared. There's nothing to be afraid of. But there's something to count with, to prepare for, and to be mature about. And I don't mean the death experience. That's very short compared to our whole life and death cycles. Rather, I would talk about life. I would talk about the purpose why you were born. Whether you ever ask the question, why am I alive? Why do I use this mind, this heart, this body? Now, if you're attached to thinking or emotions or your good and bad based ideas, you will soon run out of options. This is a very narrow, small box called your known personality. And of course, you can 
dig into your subconscious and then start exploring your uh, archetypes and other you know hidden layers of reality and even that is pretty limited compared to what you find beyond that i think uh, saying anything more about don't know which cannot be put into words whatever i say would be a mistake so i would rather share this mistake with you and listen to your questions any kind of question can you say more about Karma is interesting because we in the West try to identify that with our fate. Mm. And fate is very deterministic and very descriptive. But in the Orient, karma is generated by our minds. So the Avatamsaka Sutra says, if you want to understand the nature of this universe, the biggest chunk of karma we know is this universe, and perceive it as created by mind alone. Attaining this mind is our job. Attaining this mind is the experience of don't know or not knowing. The oriental view of karma is very similar to the new physics started about 100 years ago. Cause and effect is karma. The accumulation of cause and effect is also karma. Action and result, wherever that is in your psychophysical continuum, whether it's thought, speech, emotion, or action, cause and effect, also karma. You make it, you have it. Cause, condition, result, also karma. The accumulation of all this into personality traits, that's also karma. Forming the notion of personality, that's also karma. The sense of a distinct ego or identity, that's also karma. This karma being born, getting old, dying and reborn again, if you believe in incarnation, that's the circular or cyclical path of karma. Now, what's most important about this, that karma doesn't exist by itself. We make it, and all beings with their minds make it, whether human or other kinds of minds. Depending on our karma, we get the next body. Dog mind, dog body. Human mind, human body. If you make karma, that means you were born in one way or another. If you don't have a body, if you don't have individuality, if you don't have I, my, me, you don't make karma. That means if you have karma, you made it. If you want to unmake it, you also have to be born. Without incarnation, you cannot change your karma. You can only see it. Okay? So, how do we connect the transcendental and the material, so to speak? We start to see our karma while we are in the body. That's why we practice. We connect life and death and go beyond life and death by practicing perception. By perceiving our karma, we can change the direction of that karma. We can remove energy from that karma. We can completely change it because there is no fixed element in it. All these actions and results, all these accumulations, all these habits, all these identifications which I listed recently, are impermanent, dependent on causes and conditions, and imperfect. That means unfinished. So, if your mind stops making karma, then soon or later it can disappear entirely. That's the good news. And there is no bad news except that we, we love to make new karma again. Mm. So you become pure and clear, absolutely enlightened, then you get dirty again because you love it so much. Mm. And that's how we are human beings, okay? So don't be surprised. Especially don't try to hold on to any result of your retreat or meditation practice. Your result is not your result, okay? Your result is all beings' result. When we talk about karma, people are many times, you know, having this desire, oh, I should be free from karma. If you totally become free from karma, then 
how would you be born? I would rather connect karma and free will, which seems to go opposite, not just because Schopenhauer was writing about it a lot. But also it seems that this world tries to determine us, push us, and our free will resists. So how about, first of all, changing your view on your karma? This is like not knocking your head against the wall of destiny, which you saw as destiny until now, but actually trying to find a key to a gate which leads through that wall. And this gate is the gate of your mind, and the key is what we call don't know or no thinking. How about finding the key to the gate which leads you through the wall? That means you can go beyond your hindrances. So you change your view on your karma and you try to attain how you make it right here, right now. And then you change the direction where it goes. You change the purpose. You change the way of operation. You don't try to take it all away because if you truly, really, literally take away all your karma, you're gone. You have no body left. You have no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. All gone. How about having some free choice instead? Sounds much better, right? Mm -hmm. Living without bread for the sake of being free from bread, it doesn't last long, especially in the country of the boulangerie. Mm -hmm. If you don't have baguette in France, the country breaks down in 72 hours. So you don't want to take away bread. Rather, make yourself conscious why you eat that bread, what kind of baguette you like, and whether you want salted or unsalted butter, depending on your blood pressure and other conditions. So, how about having some skilled and smart approach to your own karma, and having a key rather than a gun? People want to use these huge guns of chemical and other types of experiences to burn or break this wall. But all they do is they destroy their, their lives. So how about finding the key? Even admitting that there is a gate and there is a key, that takes suffering. And if you're mature, you want the key. You want to open the door. And you want to go through and maybe help others go through as well. So karma is interesting because if you understand how it works, you are no longer concerned with your own life or death. You are concerned with the awakened mind that found the key and opened the door. So that means your awakening starts to help other people. Starts to give insight spontaneously and clearly to other people how human heart and mind operate, how life and death operate, because you have the experience. And if you have the experience, you can help. If you don't have the experience, you can be very smart and knowledgeable and helpful, but you don't go to the core because you learned all the names of water, but you didn't have this. So that's how you liberate yourself from karma and then use karma later to help all beings. So first we are attached to karma, then we can see this karma, then we become free from this karma, then we use this karma again in a totally different way to help all beings wake up. So don't worry about karma, but really see how it works. And for, for Christ's sake, don't try to 100% control your karma. You end up in the ditch somewhere totally and absolutely wasted. Why? Because you wanted to control your karma. You know what that is? Obsession. Obsessive compulsive behavior begins with the control mind. So, perceive, attain freedom, and then use again in a different way to help all beings. That's how we relate to karma in Zen. Other questions? Uh, first, thank you very much for your words. Absolutely wonderful and very influential. Um, I uh, would like to ask um, you about what Zen Buddhism um, teaches about consciousness. 
I know that uh, consciousness and mind are so much interchangeable and uh, many people really do not, some people think that the mind is the brain and we know that consciousness doesn't reside in a brain, it is an immaterial entity which affects uh, material entities. But I would like to know that what uh, Zen Buddhism uh, says about consciousness, does it consider super consciousness and uh, what it is its function? What is it that thinks in you? In me, it is uh, it is in between my consciousness and uh, and my perception. What is it that says my consciousness, my perception? What's that? Uh, that's my consciousness. Is that different from your perception? Um, uh, no, it is my consciousness. I perceive my consciousness perceives it via my brain. So consciousness perceives consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. How many layers are there? Well, I think there are many. I think, but this I, oh, many yeah. I or one? Mm. Uh, uh, well, uh, how, okay, um, I believe there is one. I believe there is one. Yeah. So I believes a one, mm. which there is. So mm. is that two or one? Well, I don't know how to say that. Uh, we are getting there. Okay. We don't know how to say. Yeah. Yeah. Then mm. we don't know how to define. Mm then we also don't know what it is. Mm. Correct. Mm. Your consciousness originally is this don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Stick with it. Mm. It's your best non-definition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Everything sure. else is a bigger departure from the truth. Mm -hmm. So consciousness is fantastic, except we don't know its foundation. We know its function. Mm -hmm. We know its content. We know many things about it, except we don't know what it is. Mm. So... If you talk to uh, nuclear physicists, they will love you for that because yeah, sure, they actually sure, sure. don't know where mm. all these particles mm. come from, but mm. they function in a very more or less predictable, mm. at least statistically, statistically mm. predictable way. Your consciousness is the same. It's the compound and the collection of all your thoughts and feelings and perceptions and memories and whatnot. But if I wanted to define what it is, it would be totally and absolutely wrong. Hmm. Any explicit thought-based cognitive definition is falling short of reality. The Chinese used to ask, how could you find a bull on which you are already sitting? Hmm. That's the problem. And it's not a tautology or some inert paradox. Hmm. These are creative paradoxes. Hmm. These are supposed to kind of hurl you towards hmm. experience. Hmm. So, don't know. Mm. This don't know is your great mind, mm -hmm. including your consciousness, mm. and that's where I stop. Mm. Anything else would be more and more limiting. Oh, no, absolutely. So the sickness of Western thought is that we want to extract the essence, and we want to consider the essence supremely important and everything, all other peripheral phenomena, unimportant. Now, that's what wrecks civilizations. Mm -hmm. So, either we perceive everything as it is, including our own mind, which has truly no definition whatsoever, or we start to play with these toys and attach to those toys and identify with these toys, and then we lose everything. Okay? Does, uh, does then Buddhism give a name to consciousness, like, uh, yes. like the Brahman, like the Tao, like... For you, I have a special name for your consciousness. Okay. Georgi. Mm -hmm. I think you're happy with that, right? Totally. Everyone has that special name for their consciousness. Mm. Mm. Our job as human beings is to go beyond that, in this case, beneath that. What is it that says Georgi in you? What is it that moves your body, sees with your eyes, hears with your ears? Now that's totally unbound, undefined, unborn, and undying. Therefore, don't know. Mm. Don't know or this is way better. It's the least of a lie. I say Buddha nature and I have to wipe my mouth immediately. You know, or divine spark or all these things. People have so many ideas based on this, you know. The more object-oriented they are, the more dependent they are on these kind of new age ideas, the more definitions and ideas they have. Therefore, the further they will get from the truth. So Zen is, uh, 
of course, is tolerant for everything, but you don't stop at anything partial. So either we get to the very bottom of it, or we don't stop, okay? So are you happy with your consciousness? Yes, thank you very Me much. Me too. <laughs> More questions? Yeah, I just have a question. Um, or, or could, could you be more specific when you talk of thinking? I mean, there's thinking as a, a thought, and there's also the sort of the noise, sort of the monkey on the shoulder that, you know, tells you You mean the mind the chatter? Yeah. Okay. When you say We're thinking, there. do you refer to the former or to the... Do you refer to the chatter or do you refer to both or do you refer to straight thinking, like logical thinking? I refer to anything cognitive in your frontal lobe and above and beneath and wherever. So anything which has a word, anything which has a concept, that's all cognition, that's all thinking. Whether it's primary creative impulse and you become the greatest novelist or you have this multiple mind chatter with meta thinking layers all the time or your mind is totally disintegrated into this functional set of concepts and it's just this slow sludge of cognitive flow you know and countless other variations of mental functions how your mind arranges you know the concepts that's all thinking but depending on the functionality of this thinking or the, your relationship to this thinking you feel whether you are creative you are productive, or you are confused, or you are disoriented, etc. It's all thinking. Yeah, but some, some, some people connect to reality like through sensation more than thinking. Oh, absolutely. Like my dog, if I have one. Well, I mean, I wouldn't uh, disvalue or <laughs> undervalue people who connect to reality through sensation, meaning it's maybe, it's their, it's maybe how they're most uh, uh, effective. I mean, that's the... That's that the, the, the developed way of connecting to, uh, to whatever is around them. Well, they take, uh, sorry, I just finished that. They take into account what is really there, you know, like... Direct where, experience is wonderful. But if we are only directly experiencing without cognition, you cannot structure it, you cannot analyze it, you cannot do anything to organize ourselves as human society. So... During this talk, I was super careful not to be for or against your or our cognitive processes or thoughts. I just wanted to clearly point out the origin of all this, because that's when in its birth, at its root, you can see it, you can change its direction, you can perceive it. But in terms of sensational experience, wonderful, let's go to Pompidou Centre, and then we have se several exhibitions which are about uh, tactile, you know, or even olfactive sensations. So in Zen we say, what do you see now? What do you hear now? What do you taste now? What do you touch now? So this moment actually can become clear by focusing on primary experiences. Primary, sensory, quote-unquote, material experiences. But why do we do that? One reason only so that you would perceive that your thoughts work exactly in the same way. You see various colors and forms here. You see concepts and definitions and webs of thoughts here. The Orientals, they took the brain as the sixth organ, not in the mystical sense, in the very clear everyday sense, that your brain produces and senses thoughts, just like, you know, your skin senses, you know, touch, or your nose senses some, some smell. So many people are not aware of their direction because they are not aware of their thinking. They don't know where they go. They just take one stop after the other. Now, how stupid would that be if you wanted to use the subway system in Paris, you know? It has more than 12 lines, plus buses, plus everything on the surface. If you don't know where to go, you would be stuck forever in it with one carnet ticket. That's why it's really important to see, to perceive all this. And uh, just take your thoughts as the production of your brain and something, I know it's more than that. It's more than just the brain. In fact, it's way more than that. 
But let's stick with the material base of your sensation, how you perceive your thoughts. And if you take it as that, then you can differentiate the other two important functions, distinction and judgment, and memory. Some people believe that whatever you ever experienced through your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind gets stored in your eighth consciousness, which is your memory. That's not true. The seventh consciousness determines whether you identify with your experience or let go of it. And if you let go of it, you can forget it. And if you forget it, you become actually free from it. It's possible. But deeper and more traumatic experiences, extremely good, extremely bad label experiences, take a lot of inner work to let go of, like I said earlier during the talk. Build up a mental distance, remove the judgment, remove the identification, remove the energy. It's gone. Karma doesn't exist by itself. So your memory is the same. It doesn't exist by itself. You fuel it. You make it happen. You keep it alive by being identified with it consciously or subconsciously, positively or negatively. So that's how this psychophysical existence works. So that's why if you start with cognition, if you start with thinking, if you start with uh, where our mind begins or ends, you get to the whole picture. So I also urge you, don't stop before your experience is complete. Whatever you practice, try to have some kind of school where it doesn't stop with thinking and definitions and techniques and whatnot. Technique is like the glass. All right? But we drink water. We don't drink the glass. This glass tells you how it holds the water, how much it can have, whether it's transparent or not. But it, this has nothing to do with drinking. But you need some kind of technique for that. So either it's, the, it's a pitcher or a glass or your own hand or the ground itself that holds the water. But if it's just H2O hanging in the air, you don't get to drink that much. I'd like to know, how do we put energy in the problem, in our problem? How do we put energy? Yes, I, maybe I understood not so well, but I... You, are, you understood it really well. Mm -hmm. So how we put energy into the problem? Mm -hmm. You remember your first love? How did you put energy into your first love? When your first love became a little bit less burning than in the first few years, maybe, it changed its nature, right? In fact, it didn't. You changed your relationship to that person. Mm -hmm. Then you started to put energy into it differently. Mm -hmm. Maybe less calls, less letters, less meetings. We put energy into things and relationships in the same way. But we have polarities of desire, so it becomes creative, and anger, it becomes destructive. And the most shocking or painful thing is that we have obviously the same person but the relationship we want st uh, stops from being based on desire it swings over without reaching a balance point into anger and we want to destroy the relationship and if not then the person himself or herself so that's how we put energy into it first we have polarity like and dislike mind then we have possessive instinct and then we have a lot of energy put into fulfilling our desires, fulfilling our possessive instinct, because that goes back also to survival. So survival, possession, creation. These three basic instinct groups, they drive the energy, because that's what you believe in, conditioned as a human being, that this is what you need for your life, to be fulfilled, protected, understood, everything. So what you believe is directing your energy. You put your faith right here, your energy goes there. Because your faith must become reality. Your belief must become an experience. So if you don't believe in anything, then you don't have energy for anything and anyone. You believe in someone, 
you believe in something, that's where your energy goes. And if you, if you believe in anything and anyone as they are, your energy goes everywhere. And you don't lose it. It gets recycled. The more you give, the more you get. The less you give, the less you get. But what you ask about energy is supremely important because where your faith is, that's where your energy is, and that's where your trust should be. So faith and trust, they go hand in hand. If they are not together, then people are either overly skeptical or naive, or their minds are split. They compartmentalize their emotions. Their emotions do not connect because rationally you separated them from one another because it would become too challenging. That's where your, your mirror is partitioned. It can go into split consciousness also. When people have divided mind, they have divided energy. Whatever that division brings, it's less than the undivided. So if people feel totally cluttered up, that means your rational thinking, your definitions, they are holding up their energy because they all separate, 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 separate. In the Orient, they used to say, your arm is good as it is. Don't cut it up into small pieces. Then you lose all the energy, all the power. You cannot lift anything. Okay? Mind is the same. Distinctions are important. Discriminations are harmful. Then energy is divided. Faith is broken. There are only small beliefs, small ideas, conflicting definitions and whatever you have in your mind. And then energy is lost. The moment you don't attach to these ideas, the moment you do not identify with these discriminations, the moment you reunite your energy, your mind becomes one. Mind and energy are the two sides of the same thing. We don't know what that is. Silence is too little. Speech is too much to experience that. That's why we use something which gives you the experience of cutting of thinking. This is not just cuts of thinking. This also unites your mind. So your mind becomes one. Energy appears. Your energy is not your reaction to this gesture. That's just your reaction. When you experience this one mind without the stick hitting the floor, without hearing the sound, that's when this one mind appears. And that's when this surge of energy appears, usually during meditation, not even the formal part, but afterwards. You go out of the room, and you look at the sky and the people and the houses with a totally fresh eye. And you hear the sounds of Paris as if you heard it for the first time. That's what I'm talking about. That freshness, that oneness, that energized consciousness. Okay? You started talking about meditation, and I wanted to ask you if you could connect the meditation to karma and to don't know. How, how we can connect the three. If we meditate, and I don't just mean this formal sitting meditation, but that's how we begin. We can perceive karma. We can attain the source of this karma, which is our don't know mind, clear mind. So meditation is a means to perceive karma, where that karma comes from, and the mind that generates that karma. And by meditation, you can come back to this not moving body, not moving speech, not moving mind, this complete stillness. And that is important. That's the Alpha and the Omega together, beginning and end together. Good and bad, not separated yet. No self either. No self, no world, no other. And even if you have that for a moment, that experience helps you because you see everything else in name and form as illusory. Illusory doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Illusory means that it's not the absolute. It's relative. So in its true nature, it means it's relative. Not absolute, that means created by someone else, not dependent on your mind, not subject to cause and effect, not subject to impermanence. So meditation is truly insight, attainment, 
experience. And then your karma cannot control you. You control your habits. You change the direction of these habits. I get confused when I hear that. You change. Who is the you? It changes. Who is asking? Who's answering? Very good. <laughs> Next level. <laughs> uh oh, I got I passed that one. <laughs> no. Not yet. Ask me again who is asking? Who's asking? Your skirt is black, the carpet is gray. When I ask you who is answering, who is asking, is the same thing, this kind of clear mirror consciousness which sees that your skirt is black and the carpet is gray. That's the truth. When I asked you back, I referred to this essence, this essential point, okay? Then I referred to truth which you perceive in your clear mirror consciousness, in your don't know mind. Then sky is blue, trees are green, you're holding the mic, the carpet is gray. So that's truth. Next is function. So there are many kinds of correct answers to this, who is asking, who is answering. If I want to be functional and bodhisattva way and Zen, etc., I would ask you back, how may I help you? Is meditation enough? What is meditation? Finding time every day to give to oneself a moment of stillness, a moment of no thought. That isn't a moment, but that is a certain amount of time in which, through whatever means one is comfortable with or knows, empties oneself of the world. It's very sincere what you say, but essentially you talk about schedule at this point. <laughs> well, but for meditation, I, and this is a question, this is why I'm asking it, it's, it's, it's a nice thing, and it's, it's almost, I don't want to say it's like going to the gym, because that would be to trivialize it, but it is something that I would have thought one needs to commit to on a regular basis to okay. have the benefits. So first, it begins with the gym. It begins with the form. It begins with committing some time, but that is just schedule, just like meditation technique is the glass, not the water. So finding time for some form of meditation is truly essential, and I totally agree with you with that, but that's not where it stops. Meditation means your mind is clear like space, clear like a mirror, moment to moment, 24-7, day and night, life and death. That clarity itself is meditation. Retaining that clarity is also meditation. Using that clarity to help all beings is also meditation. So right you are. It begins with the schedule, begins with the form. But you take that meditation to the street so what do you see now? What do you hear now? What are you doing now? What do you feel now? How do you connect to people? So your perception of situation, meditation. Your establishing of relationships, meditation. Your function in the world, that's also meditation. So that kind of clarity, that kind of human responsibility, that insight, that non-dualistic experience, the compassion that comes out of it, the wisdom that comes out, that's also all meditation. Okay? So we start with a little seedling, and it opens up, and it becomes Bois de Boulogne very soon. Okay? More questions? What does Zen Buddhism say about love? I don't know what Zen says about love. I know what I say about it. Okay, what do you say about love? Love is wonderful. What else? <laughs> okay, it's good enough for me. Okay. If you can distinguish between loyalty and attachment, then love can endure. If love becomes attachment and possession and, uh, and jealousy and all kinds of other things, then it, soon it transforms into something that none of those people wanted that started it. I think love is the biggest melter or the biggest agent that melts the boundaries of the ego, and everybody has to experience that. But if it's treated in the wrong way, then the energy that comes out of it can get ugly in a hurry. 
and I mean weeks. We are living in an accelerated world. Weeks, not even months or years. So, it's not just how it begins or how it endures, but what it becomes. So, it's a big task. And meditation can actually help a lot in clearly and selflessly loving somebody and receiving that love also. So, for lack of a better experience, love is the first and most important instance of oneness at all levels. But the tragedy is that it lasts so little or so short and it creates a lot of echoes and reverbs and a lot of consequences that is nothing but the homework of those that are involved. But they don't see it that way. They see it as the other's problem, the other's fault, the other's mistake. So, if your mind is clear, love can be the best experience. If your mind is not clear, love can be the worst experience. Depends what you are and how you are, and the other person too. I think that's enough. <laughs> More questions? Over there. Uh, we are talking about uh, love, but I'm asking you why love is giving you, or giving uh, people, energy. What's the relation between Creation love and, and needs energy? energy. If there's no energy, there are no babies. Very simple. What is really relevant, why do we have this total modification of consciousness when we fall in love? Nearly all languages I've heard on this earth talks about falling in love. What happens? Well, you change. So this kind of energy is necessary for a lot of reasons. One is procreation, the other is, of course, possession and enduring that kind of possessive relationship. And also defense, you know, how to defend the new home. So this kind of energy is naturally released. We call that hormonal imbalance. And that's what releases that. I know it's very, very disillusioning. <laughs> But that energy can come from many, many, many kind of parts of your body and mind, and the transmitters are hormones. That's how it works. You need energy to support that loving sentiment, otherwise it wouldn't last long. But probably you know that already. You were probably interested in the Zen angle on it. Zen doesn't have any special angle. How about judgment? Because you said that we shouldn't have any judgment, but a positive judgment can give beauty and completely change life. Yeah. So, there is nothing wrong with un peu de jugement. If you have a little judgment, that's okay. But how soon does it turn over something uh, repulsive or even hate? So, if you can take the energy out of judgment when you have to, to avoid destruction, to avoid suffering, to make the counter judgment, you know? If you have that power, no problem. But beauty exists because ugliness exists. You attach to beauty, you will suffer from ugly. So I would rather have a distinction between ugly and beautiful. I see beauty as beauty, ugly as ugly, but I don't have any judgment over it, whether one is good or the other is bad, okay? It's also clear that for your own mental health and, you know, uh, physical harmony, whatever, we want to surround ourselves with beautiful things. We don't want to live in an ugly environment. We don't want to be surrounded with entities and things that we consider repulsive. That's also true. But we, but we should also see that the notion of beauty is dependent on our minds. It's defined by our own ideas. It doesn't exist absolutely by itself. So our notion of beauty and requirements for harmony and welfare, they are all different. So in Zen, we don't say beautiful or ugly. We say thusness or suchness. It is like that. It is as it is. So the stick is neither short nor long. It's just like this. Neither beautiful nor ugly, but brown. Now, 
this kind of dustness or suchness goes to your concept of beauty too, or your concept of love too. So you see your own distinctions as part of this reality, not separate from it. You are aware that you make it beautiful or you make it ugly by itself, it's just as it is. Now, we are humans, we are creative. We love to make things beautiful. Most of us like to make things beautiful. Some people like to make things ugly and heavy and suffering and miserable. Some people have those habits. We should admit, because you, you look around, some people have those habits. Now, once you are aware that this beauty, the experience, is created by mind alone, you're on the right track, because it's no longer a judgment, it's a creation. Then you're on the right track. You can create super beautiful things, but you will never identify with it and never exclude other forms of existence. And least of all, would you judge them at beautiful is good, ugly is bad. That's one of the biggest misconceptions. You're bleeding on the street because you cut yourself, you walked barefoot. And there's glass. And somebody really ugly comes with band-aid and disinfectant. Would you refuse it? When, when you say ah is ah, what is the, your uh, answer? I don't know. That's what your answer. That's my answer. Thank you. You're welcome. And how does Zen Buddhism deal with the question of pleasure? Again, I don't know how Zen Buddhism deals with pleasure. I know how I deal with it. Okay. Pleasure is just pleasure. Pain is just pain. What is marvelous about human experience is that you don't have to think about it. You have to see where it comes from, where it goes. But if you think about pleasure, you destroy it. You think about pain, you make it worse. It hurts more if you think about it. So pleasure is just one of the sensations. Pain is also just one of the sensations. And uh, it's just as impermanent bound to conditions and imperfect as anything else. But there's one thing. Um, pleasure or the lack thereof can either put you to sleep or it can wake you up. That depends on you. There is no specific objective definition or distinction which pleasure puts you to sleep and which pleasure wakes you up. Same with art, same with food, same with love, same with anything. So when you see that, you see that pleasure is originally empty. It's made, it has no fixed attributes, you feel one way or another, and you decide what you do with it. Now, when you experience pleasure in that way, one thing is certain, you will not become dependent. Because you cannot depend on an illusion. I had a second question. Yeah, go ahead. And it has I'm to sorry. do with the fear. 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 My favorite which area. Is, which, <laughs> which deals with reincarnation. Uh huh. Because uh, seeing the situation in the world, whenever people talk about reincarnation, I feel very ill at ease. And deep down I say, I hope I will not reincarnate because I would not like to be anywhere else and in, a, in one of the many horrible situations places in the world right now. And so I wanted to know what, how, how does reincarnation, how is it conceived in Zen Buddhism, or how you conceive it? Uh, you make it, you have it. You don't make it, you don't have it. If you make it and you hate it, then you are reborn with hatred towards incarnation. But as long and fear the same, adoration the same, any kind of reflection or reaction to reincarnation does not change the fact that you did it. Why? Because you made it happen. As long as the mind has any fixed identity, any kind of I, my, me, 
out of that comes the energy of wanting and not wanting, desire and anger, views of dualistic nature. And as long as we have that, the Buddha calls this thirst or tanha. As long as we have all this, we have karma. If we have karma, we want to be born. Whatever karma we have, independence of that, you will have your next body. Would you like to be a therapist again? You spend your life helping other people with your own style of therapy. So how would you not be born as a therapist next lifetime? I'm giving you a hint. Are you a therapist or is your job a therapist? That's where it begins. My job is a therapist. My job is a Zen teacher. My way of life is a monk. Your true nature, your true self, has no job. Your personality does. You are not your karma, but you are fully responsible for your kar karma. The longer you identify with this, the harder it is to change it. If you don't identify with it, you can offer it to all beings, and yet you are not that. And that's how you become free from any condition. Wake up from the identification, take full responsibility, and offer it to all beings. That means you don't have any self invested in it. Any identity, any attachment, any dualistic judgment, nothing of that sort. Then you're free. But we live our lives. And therefore, we can offer all this to all beings in the Bodhisattva way. And that means you will have a choice. You will not have a bondage. So being born out of bondage always results in some kind of heavy homework. Sometimes downright misery. Yet, even those people wanted to be born. Yet, they have free will. They have these tremendously bad conditions and they want to fulfill their destiny. They want to live their karma. Have you ever asked why? It's the only way to change it. To live is the only way to change karma. Mostly we make more. But if we realize after some threshold of pain and suffering, if we turn the energy inside, if we become less selfish, if we attain our true nature or true mind, and all this begins to change, and we can cast off the burden, we can offer help to all beings, and this compassionate and selfless approach ensures that your homework is done and you will have a choice. Awakened ones have choices, and those who do not wake up, they have bondage by their own ignorance, by their own totally covered mind. So, in a way, it's really simple. Keep don't know, and then you will have a choice over your next life. I wonder what you have to say about what I'm going to say. Of course, you don't know because I haven't said it yet. It's the best. <laughs> Keep it that way. Just <laughs> hang on. <laughs> we could have mind-to-mind -mind communication, but I, I want to say the words. I feel like we are very privileged. We are all sitting here in a comfortable place. We're not in danger. We all have financial means. Um, my clients have the luxury to come for an hour or however long and talk, and they have someone there that listens. And then there's the outside, and even if you say outside, inside, no difference. There's war. 240,000 or 20,000 Syrians died. And I experience frustration, rage, anger about, I'm lucky, what about those people? And I can't really, I don't know if you think it's just their karma, I cannot accept that. It's like, why, why do we have the luxury of having you here and having, it's really wonderful, and people outside are being killed. Okay. I, I have difficulty understanding, okay. and how does Buddhism look at that? Okay, wonderful question. First of all, when you want to experience the essence or the true nature of this universe, for that, inside, outside have to become one. But, if you use your clarity and you perceive the truth, then you see 
that Syria is in Syria and France is in France. The biggest wisdom is how to manage your compassion so that your own compassion wouldn't be your own impediment or hindrance. That's why in the West, some people say that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And it has a point. How do we get out of hell and get other people out of hell with our good intentions? That's the question. Now, basically we have a few choices, but one is going through the mind and the other is going through the form. The form is the external means. So then you make demonstrations, you are a political activist, you sign up uh, to fight for the good cause, if you find the good cause. And uh, various other forms in the world. But the, let me remind to the basic teaching of the Buddha. Suppose you want to stop the killing of all these innocent civilians, etc., etc. Then you have to use weapons, get to the battlefield. Uh, you have a very, very difficult situation. Because by your own intentions, you make things worse. The Buddha said in the Dhammapada, war cannot be stopped by war. War will be stopped with peace. Hatred will not be stopped by hatred. Hatred will be stopped by love. So when you take this difficult path of not going through the form, but going through the mind, it's very hard to accept that this is a slower and seemingly less efficient and outside not so much appearing method. But if you look at the way this world operates, if you make opposites stronger, you lose. If you counteract evil with evil, you make it stronger. So that's why in the Buddha's teaching we don't take sides, but we clear our minds. And you give help, you know, to certain organization if you wish, to certain, let's say, impartial charities to get things done when it's possible. But you cannot prevent anger with anger. You cannot stop a war with a war. When that is reality for you, then you know what to do. So, in this case, why is there no more people fighting for the good cause? Why are there no more people fighting for the right side? Because there is no right side. We have to put an end to this without weapons. And that's the hardest. So, it's also a very big don't know how to do this. But we have to ask the question how we keep our minds moment to moment. If my mind goes into the dualistic game of anger, desire and ignorant views, I already lost even though I have not gone to the battlefield. Judging these people in one way or another calling one the victim and the perpetrator, these are wrong views. Out of these wrong views come anger and desire or greed. And if we go that way, we will never stop it. We'll only start a new cycle. And it's the hardest to accept. Because for thousands of years on this planet, we wanted short-term solutions. We wanted quick fixes. We wanted peace treaties, you know. And those peace treaties sow the seeds of new wars. Inside the minds, there were no peaceful thoughts. There were just bad compromises. You look at Europe, the 20th century was exceptional. How did we make two world wars started here in Europe? The thoughts that we exported to Asia all started in Europe. So history shows how not to do things. So in this case, the word is how may I help you. How may I help you has a bunch of components. First of all, you look at the Four Noble Truths by the Buddha. The fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering. If you line up your how may I help you mind to the Four Noble Truths, you are patient. 
You don't want quick fixes. You don't want weapons. You don't want to have victory over evil because there is no such victory. If we refrain from doing the wrong things, soon we find what we can do right. Something that I've realized in, in sitting with this question, because this is a very old question, um, and it's very unpopular to probably for many people to say what I'm going to say, but I feel, I don't know if it's as much, let's just use the word compassion for those who chop people's heads off and those people who, whose heads get chopped off. It's just the same thing. To be able to do that, they must be in such pain. I'm, I've never been in that situation in this life, but they must be in such pain. That Feeling compassion to both parties involved is a very advanced mind, and this is wonderful. And uh, without that compassion, we actually cannot stop it. That's for sure. Our compassion should be universal and going out to all beings. And obviously, it's articulated differently to the victim and to the perpetrator. One needs this kind of application and the other needs that. Without compassion, it's not going to work. Without non-dualistic wisdom, it's not going to work. Without attaining our own true nature, which is free from greed and anger, it's not going to work. But once we do that, we find a way. More practically, what kind of decision-making power do we have directly over that situation? And you should admit, not much. Even if you go to the biggest kind of uh, relief organization, charity, because this is the only kind of legal way in that sense, what could they do? Well, they could do a lot once hostilities cease, not before. So what is your particular condition what is your particular relationship to the whole thing besides good thinking and good intentions? Then correct function will appear. But if we mistake our situation with another person's situation, that is decision-making power, if we do not recognize our correct relationship to this, we can jump straight in with a rock sack of clothes and I'm here to help and you're shot next day. Well, congratulations then the correct function will appear if we don't make mistakes with the situation and the relationship. So that's why clarity is so important. And when that clarity is yours, then the perception of your situation, relationship and function is always clear. Then you know what you can do, what you should do, and what you cannot do and should not do. These all go hand in hand. And it's perfectly okay to recognize and admit our own limitations as human beings, as these entities in this terribly fragile bodies and terribly impermanent minds. Within those limitations, we can help. And this conditioned existence is not a mistake. After all, we were born into it. Conditioned existence is a wake-up call. Even when Ramakrishna lost his nephew, he cried for three days without stopping. Um, uh, we've all lost friends, mothers, fathers, maybe lovers, masters. Uh, how do you deal with grief? I grieve. That's how I deal with grief. Mm -hmm. I don't stop it. When I grieve, I only grieve. Mm -hmm. As long as it lasts, it lasts. Mm -hmm. And I don't stop my duties, I don't stop my everyday life, I grieve. And that's really important, to grieve. Otherwise, we don't realize our own true situation on this planet. But th when the grief is over, then it's over. Grief is impermanent just like your lover, your parent, your master, etc., etc. Grief also is impermanent. Furthermore, if we are attached to grief, then we cannot help the person who deceased. Mm. The deceased has to go. Our grief can bind them to this earth. So grieving for some time is perfectly okay, like I said. But how do you transform your grief 
which can turn into selfish grief. You grieve for yourself. You were bereft. You are left alone. Sometimes you are feeling, like, why did you leave me? I wanted you to stay. Why didn't you love me more, teach me more, help me more, cuddle me more, hate me more? All this is selfish. So when grief is not selfish, then you start to ask, how does my grief help the deceased? Then maybe you do some chanting, maybe you do some effective ceremony, maybe you do something to help that mind on his or her way. For that, we have to have the right view. One part of the Noble Eightfold Path is the right view. For that, we have to have right effort, right meditation, right speech, right livelihood, etc., etc. But without this right view, we are limited by our own self, by our own views and desire and anger. So if we believe that uh, the path of a mind just finishes with the bodily death, that's actually a very big limitation. So how do we help that mind that moves on? And that means we have to send some very nice signal to the mind, A, you're dead. Wake up from life. Wake up from the illusion of having still some senses because you don't. B, find your direction very soon. You cannot stay in places where you cannot change your karma, cannot perceive your karma, cannot proceed on your path. So perceive your path, find your direction, and go on. Now, everything I've said, in short, is in correct memorial ceremonies. Maybe it's more ceremonial, maybe it's more classic in its you know, verbal form. But what I've just said is actually a very important message, plus thanking the deceased for the life that he or she lived thanking them for all the help that we got from them. A sense of appreciation will overcome the sense of loss. In that sense, grief will stop being selfish. See the grief, live the grief, transform it into help. Accept the loss. And you know that they also lost this life. And then you can help. Then you can help. And we should help. Go ahead. And if the grief is uh, over someone that's still living, a, a relationship that didn't exist, doesn't exist anymore. Mm, pretty much the same, same thing. thing. It doesn't mean that the person is dead for you. Right. It means that the relationship is dead. And uh, for that, we don't have a memorial ceremony. We have a farewell ceremony. In fact, there are unfinished relationships or uh, I would say mentally violent separations that affect children, that affect uh, you know, other relatives, that we had to work out that ceremony when you terminate a relationship, although the person is still alive. I wouldn't call it divorce because it's way bigger than a divorce. What I call this is a farewell ceremony. When you consciously want to remove all the energy from a relationship because it, the duality doesn't serve any person anymore. So then the, this duality, this like and dislike, this kind of attraction, repulsion, it all has to stop. If you don't take the energy out of it, it will still linger in your subconscious. And those subconscious drivers can become so self-destructive, it's terrible. What people do, each, do to each other and themselves out of guilt, out of blame, out of projections. And it's all because inside they didn't finish. And if somebody is alive, it's harder. Somebody is dead, okay, I'm grieving. I have a platform how to finish things. But if somebody is still alive, they don't know how to finish. And either they become attracted later, the rendezvous with the divorced you know, partner, it's a known, known topic, or it becomes really hateful. If I see you again, I kill you. This kind of mind. So again, polarities come into function. So next time they meet, they go to bed again. Or next time they meet, they want to kill each other. Mm -hmm. So love and hate. Mm -hmm. You take the energy out. You take the identity out. You take the dualistic movement out. It's gone. That's why these ceremonies are very helpful. It's not just some form, least of all religious. It has deep function. And that's how you finish it. Okay. I sincerely appreciate your wonderful attention tonight. That's
And I also hope that I'll see some of you, if not most of you, tomorrow during this retreat. And uh, I want to thank Judith, Lavinia, and Lucia for their organizational effort. Uh, in all, merci beaucoup. Kosonam sepan. Achula Bay. Thank you very much for your attention. See you tomorrow.